All right, let's go through paper six, which is the alternative to the practical for chemistry from IGCSE. This is Cambridge International Examination, CIE, and this is May, June, 2018, variant three, so 0620 slash 63. All right, let's get started. Ready. Question one. Zinc sulfate crystals are hydrated. They contain water of crystallization. A student did an experiment to find the mass of water in hydrated zinc sulfate crystals. The hydrated zinc sulfate crystals were weighed and then heated with a Bunsen burner to remove the water as shown. Okay, so they had the, their balance and then they had a watch glass with their hydrated zinc sulfate crystals on top. And once that was, once that was weighed, then they put them into this little container here and they heated it and all the water that's, that's associated with the zinc sulfate crystals evaporated off and you're just left with the zinc sulfate that's anhydrous, no water associated with it. So A1, name the apparatus used to weigh the crystals in A. So this is called a balance. And two, complete the box to name the apparatus. So this uh, ceramic dish thing is called a crucible. All right. B, what position should the air hole of the Bunsen burner be in when heating the hydrated sulfate crystals in B? Okay, so you have your little Bunsen burner here. There's a stand. Okay, you have your flame coming up here. Now you have an air hole down here. That air needs to, that hole that needs to be opened so that oxygen can come in and combust the fuel. All right, so it needs to be open. Okay, because you need to have a very hot flame. C, describe how the student could find out if all of the water of crystallization had been removed from the hydrated zinc sulfate crystals. All right, in order to find out, the student needs to weigh the solid and then heat it until the mass doesn't change. So the student should weigh the solid and then heat it until the mass remains constant. D, describe a chemical test for water. Okay, a physical one is testing the, the melting point or boiling point to make sure it's water. This is a chemical test. And there's two you could choose from. You could choose anhydrous copper sulfate. So anhydrous copper sulfate or cobalt chloride. Okay, so the result of the anhydrous copper sulfate, that would be blue. It would look blue. So it would turn from white to blue. Or if you chose the cobalt, co co cobalt chloride, it would be pink. It would turn from blue to pink. Only choose one or the other. These are just both options you could choose from. Two, a student investigated how the temperature changed when aqueous sodium hydroxide re reacted with solutions of two different acids, acid R and acid S. Two experiments were done. Experiment one, a measuring cylinder was used to pour 50 centimeters cubed of aqueous sodium hydroxide into a polystyrene cup and the temperature of the solution was measured. Okay, so they had a polystyrene cup and they put in 50 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide. All right, and they measured the temperature. That's our beautiful thermometer. My drawings are lovely, I know. A burette was filled up to the zero centimeter cube mark with acid R and five centimeters cubed of acid R was added to the aqueous sodium hydroxide in the polystyrene cup and the solution stirred. So they added five centimeters cubed of R, whatever that R was, the acid. Okay, so we're adding, they're adding acid into alkali. It'll be, an, it'll be a neutralization reaction. The highest temperature of the solution was measured. All right, then another five centimeters cubed of acid R was added to the polystyrene cup and the solution was stirred and the highest temperature of the solution was measured. And then further five centimeter cubed portions of acid R were added to the polystyrene cup until a total volume of 40 centimeters cubed of acid R had been added. The highest temperature of the solution was measured after each addition. Okay, so it started with five centimeters cubed and then they added all the way down to 40 centimeters cubed. A. Use the thermometer diagrams to record the results in the table. Okay, so when nothing was added, it was at 21 degrees Celsius. Now, if you write degrees Celsius in the table, 
you will lose marks because it's already in the heading. There is no need to write units in the table. All right. So if you look at this, this is 20 to 25 and there's five marks. So each mark goes up by one degree Celsius. All right. So just reading these numbers, here we have 23 degrees Celsius. Here we have 25 degrees Celsius and they're all exactly on the line up to no half degrees. So that makes it easy. Here we have 27. And at 20 centimeters cubed, we have 29. At 25 centimeters, it's 31. And then we have 30 and 29 and 28. So these should be pretty straightforward readings. Now this is the, the one that confuses quite a few people. It's actually very straightforward, but it seems confusing. B, plot the results for experiment one on the grid and draw two intersecting straight lines. Well, there's only one experiment, so how can you draw two lines? If you don't know how to do this, plot the points first, and then you'll notice it's actually very easy. Don't panic and, and worry about it before you've actually attempted to plot the points. Okay, so looking at this, we have on the y-axis, we go from 15 to 20. So that's five degrees Celsius divided by 10 squares. So that means each degree Celsius is 0 0.5 degrees Celsius per square. All right, so it's half a degree per square going up. And these are pretty clear on the bottom, on the x-axis. Okay, I'm just gonna plot the points and then you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so these are the points. Remember, you do not, do not draw a little dot like that. Do not make a little tiny dot because when you draw a line through it, it can disappear. Do not draw a big blob because obviously you don't know where the point is exactly. All right, and so either you can draw a little X or a dot, a small dot with a circle around it. Both are okay. Now, if you look at this, now you should be able to see where the two straight lines are. It, it says two intersecting straight lines. So here's one straight line. You go down to the bottom point. You draw all the way up until it goes, it should go through all the points nice and neatly. All right, and that, then you do the same with the other line. You need to go to the final point, just draw a nice straight line until you get two points that are intersecting. And if you see, they intersect at this point here at 25 uh, centimeters cubed. So when it says draw two intersecting straight lines, that's all it is, just and if you don't know what to do, it tells you what to do in the instructions. You wouldn't normally do this, except it told you to do that. Okay. So now we have experiment two. The burette was rinsed with distilled water and then with acid S. Experiment one was repeated, but using acid S instead of acid R. So remember the first time the burette had acid R in, so then they rinsed it out with distilled water and then they put in a different acid. Okay, and C, use the thermometer diagrams to record the results in the table. So you, again, you just record the results in the table and then you plot a graph. So looking at these, again, it's exactly the same. We have 21 degrees Celsius, then we have 26 degrees Celsius, and at 10 we have 31, at 15 centimeters cubed we have 32, at 20 centimeters cubed we have 31, 25 centimeters cubed, we have 30. At 30 centimeters cubed, we have 29. 35, we have 28. And then at 40 centimeters cubed, we have 27. All right. D, plot the results for experiment two on the grid and draw two intersecting straight line graphs. Again, it says do exactly the same thing. If you're unsure, if you've printed off the page twice because it looks exactly the same, it is actually a different question because this is about acid S instead of acid R. All right, so acid S is on the x-axis. All right, now again, I'll plot the points and then we can see. Okay, and these are the points. And if you don't get, if it doesn't look like two straight lines, this one looks a bit high up, then maybe you point, plotted the point wrong. So double check. And when I double check that point, it is the point it's meant to be. It's just that these lines don't intersect at a point. They intersect 
at some other point. All right. So now we have to draw the intersecting lines. So we start at the bottom and we draw a line going up. All right. And for the other line, we do exactly the same thing. We start at the farthest, one farthest away. We draw a line so it goes through all the points and it intersects at a particular point. E1. Use your graph to estimate the volume of acid which must be added to neutralize 50 centimeters cubed of aqueous sodium hydroxide. Show clearly on your grid how you worked out the answer. All right. So it says use your graph in big bold letters. That means it wants to you to draw lines on the graph. It wants you, you need to show how you used your graph. You can't just read it. Okay, so the experiment started off with 50 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide into a polystyrene cup, and then different uh, volumes of acid S were added into it. So the neutralization point is this point right here. That's not the line you should draw on your graph, but it's the point where the two lines intersect. All right, so what we need to do is you want to, to draw a line from where these points intersect all the way down to the bottom. Okay, because it wants to know the volume that's needed. Okay, so where do those lines intersect? Let's erase that, because that's not what you're supposed to draw on it. They intersect, so this is 10 squares for five. Again, that's five centimeters cubed divided by 10 squares. That means that there is 0.5 centimeters cubed per square. So we have 10, this is 11, this is 12. This is 12 centimeters cubed is necessary. So that's what you need. All right, so you showed, you showed clearly on your grid how you worked out your answer to be 12 centimeters cubed. Okay, two marks. You can't get two marks just for getting the answer. One of them you need to show on your grid how you got it. Two, suggest how the volume in E1 would differ if the experiment were repeated using 25 centimeters cubed instead of 50 centimeters cubed of aqueous sodium hydroxide. So if you had half of the amount of sodium hydro hydroxide, it would take half of the amount of acid to neutralize it. And that's because there, there are half of the number of moles of sodium hydroxide present. It's the molar ratios. So the volume of the acid would be half as much as there are half the number of moles of sodium hydroxide present. F, what type of energy change occurs when acid S reacts with sodium hydroxide? Well, the temperature went up in each case. If the temperature goes up, it's an exothermic reaction. So it's an exothermic energy change. G1. In experiment two, why was the burette rinsed with distilled water? Okay, so you had, acid, you had acid R in first, and then it was rinsed out with distilled water. And that's the reason why was to remove traces of acid R. To remove traces of the acid. And then two, why was the burette then rinsed with acid S? Well, if you have water in the burette, it's going to dilute acid S. So this is to remove traces of the water. To remove traces of the water. H. Describe one source of error in experiment two and suggest an improvement to reduce this source of error. Okay, so there's two possible ones you can really use. And one was that they used a measuring cylinder to measure out the sodium hydroxide. So they used a measuring cylinder. And measuring cylinders are a lot less accurate than a pipette or a burette. So you can say use a pipette instead. Or you can say use a burette instead. Use a pipette instead or use a burette instead. Either, either are fine. Or the other thing that, that's happening, okay, so they had their, their polystyrene cup and their NaOH, and then they added their, their acid, and they measured the temperature and heat could be lost easily going out the top. Okay, so one other source of error is heat loss from the top. And how could they prevent that? What, what could be an improvement to the experiment? They could use a lid or insulation. Okay, either one would be fine. 
Question three, solution T and liquid U were analyzed. Solution T was aqueous sodium hydroxide. Tests were done on solution T and liquid U. So tests on the so on sodium hydroxide. So we need to complete the, ex the expected observations. So solution T was divided into four portions in three test tubes and one boiling tube. A flame test was done on the first portion of solution T. So a flame test is where they check to see the color of the flame. It doesn't have anything to do with squeaky pops or whether the flame goes out. So a flame test for sodium hydroxide What does sodium look like? It is yellow. Okay, then the pH of the first portion of solution T, solution T was tested. So basically the pH of sodium hydroxide is very, very alkaline. So between 11 and 14, just choose a number between 11 and 14. I will say pH 13 is very alkaline. B, a few drops of aqueous zinc sulfate were added to the second portion of solution T in a test tube. The test tube was shaken to mix the solutions. Now this is kind of a trick question. All right, okay, normally you would have your, this, your normal thing, you would normally have the zinc sulfate and you would add a few drops, a few drops of NaOH and then you would add excess in NaOH. That's your normal, that's probably what you've studied. Now they want you to kind of turn that around completely. You have your NaOH and you're adding a few drops of zinc sulfate. All right, so that is different. So you kind of want to do the opposite. So where, so this time the sodium hydroxide is in excess and the zinc sulfate is not. So what's going to happen? So the test for uh, for zinc sulfate, for zinc, test for zinc, you add sodium hydroxide and first of all a precipitate, a white precipitate will form that dissolves. Then it dissolves. Okay, but what's going to happen? You'll put these few drops in and just around the drops you'll have a white precipitate form and then that white precipitate will dissolve because the sodium hydroxide is in excess. Okay, so we have a white precipitate. And then it clears. Okay, so that's in the first one after a few drops. You'll get, after each drop, you'll see a white precipitate that then disappears in excess sodium hydroxide. When you're add, adding, then adding an excess of zinc sulfate, you are then doing it as if a few drops of sodium hydroxide are being added. So then you'll just have a white precipitate. So this is exactly opposite to what you'd normally get. And that's, that is a trick. And C, ammonium chloride was added to the third portion of solution T in a boiling tube. The mixture was heated and the gas produced was tested. So we had ammonium chloride, NH4 plus, was added to the third portion. It was heated, so plus NaOH, and you get NH3, ammonia. Okay, so the test is use red litmus paper, and the observation is it turns blue because ammonia is very alkaline. And then D is very much like B. An excess of aqueous chromium-3 chloride was added to the fourth por portion of solution T in a test tube. Again, you have NaOH and you're adding drops of Cr3+. Normally you would have it the other way around. You would have Cr3+, adding drops of NaOH. OH. Okay, so you kind of have to do work it opposite. So what do you see? So what you would normally see with this one is it would turn it would turn gray green and then as you add more and more sodium hydroxide when you put the sodium hydroxide in ex in excess 
the it's gray green because it has a white precipitate with the green uh, the white precipitate dissolves and it just becomes green all right so this time we have an excess of chromium three chloride so it's as if you have you so you have the sodium hydroxide and then you're adding lots and lots of chromium three plus so it's as if you have this situation you're adding just a few drops of sodium hydroxide so this is is when NaOH is in excess okay so green when NaOH is in excess so it's gray green if the chromium 3 plus is, is in excess okay so it's you have to think about it in the, the opposite way to probably what you've studied that's why it's sometimes not a good idea just to memorize the things you need to think about how it works all right moving on from that question because that's that was that was pretty tricky okay tests on liquid u so some of the tests and observations are shown so tests on liquid u first of all the appearance of liquid u was studied and it looked colorless and it was pleasant smelling well there's not very many things in chemistry that you're allowed to smell that smell nice so the only thing that I can really think of that smells really nice that you're allowed to that you study in chemistry at this stage are esters okay remember esters or are organic they're organic molecules but you don't really know it's an ester so you can't say it's an ester okay it's a con so here what conclusions can you draw about liquid you you can't say it's an ester but you can say it's organic okay and a few drops of liquid U were placed onto a watch glass. The surface of the liquid was touched with a lighted splint and burned in a flu blue flame, as in it was flammable. So you have a flammable organic liquid. So it's a flammable organic liquid. So it's not very descriptive. It doesn't say exactly what it is, but you're not given a huge amount of information. You know it's flammable and it's probably organic because very few other things smell nice flowers give organic are organic and they, they smell nice but it's hard to say exactly what it could be question four some trees have purple leaves the purple color is a mixture of colored pigments plan an experiment to extract and separate the colored pigments present in the purple leaves you're, pro you're provided with some purple leaves sand ethanol and common laboratory apparatus you may draw a diagram to help you answer the question okay when it says you may draw a diagram, it says it means draw a diagram. That's what it means. You do not have to write out a list of apparatus. You just have to draw the diagram and describe what you do. All right. So this experiment is talking about chromatography. Chroma meaning color, and it wants you to separate the colors. So first of all, I'm going to draw out what the chromatography experiment looks like. Okay, you may have a slightly different way you'd set this up. That's okay. There's a, quite a few different ways. So at the top, I'm going to say that this is a piece of wood. And I'm going to say that this is a beaker. This is chromatography paper. This is a pin. Okay, and then we have down here, we have ethanol. Okay, and here we have a starting line drawn in pencil. And this is our extract spot. Okay, our spot we put the extract on. All right, a spot of extract. All right, so that's pretty much everything you need to know for a chromatography setup. But this is in two points. You're provided with purple leaves, sand, ethanol, and common labor laboratory apparatus. That means you need to use the purple leaves and the sand. You, don't, you aren't given the extract. You need to say how you would extract the pigment, and then you have to say how you do the chromatography. So you have to say both. Okay, so the first thing you do is you have to cut the leaves up into small pieces and crush them. And you, 
you crush them in ethanol with some sand in to make it so that it crushes up easier. Okay, and you use a mortar and pestle to do that. So you cut the leaves into small pieces and crush them with sand in ethanol using a mortar and pestle. All right, and then you have a liquid that's colored and so you pour off the liquid. Pour off the liquid. You could filter the liquid to get the sand out. It doesn't really matter because you're just putting on the pigment. All right, then once you have the liquid, then you apply the extract carefully onto a piece of the chromatography paper and you put it on one spot that's right at the end of the paper on a line drawn with pencil and that marks the starting location. So carefully apply the extract onto a piece of chromatography paper in one small spot located at one end on a line drawn in pencil to mark the starting location. It's in pencil because a pencil is not an ink and it doesn't rise up the paper. It would be kind of useless if the, the starting line moved. All right, then you want to let that dry and add more. Do this a few times. So let the spot dry and reapply multiple times until it is a dark spot. Okay, then you set up the chromato chromatography experiment as in the diagram above. So you set up the chromatography experiment as in the diagram above. Then you let the paper sit in the ethanol until the ethanol has been drawn up at the whole strip so that this spot has separated into multiple pigments. At once it's gone up the entire way, you mark the maximum point that the ethanol has reached so you can calculate the RF value. So let the paper sit in the ethanol until the ethanol has been drawn up the entire strip so the spot is separated into the different pigments. And finally, so mark the maximum point the ethanol reached to calculate the RF value. And remember the RF value is the distance that the solute, so the spot has gone, divided by the distance the solvent went, so the ethanol. All right, and that is all you need to write for this question. It's a lot, but you do need to make sure you put a little bit about how you extract the, how you extract the pigment and then how you separate it. And that is all you need to write for this exam. This is, that's the end of this exam. I hope you found it useful. I hope you'll do really well in your final exams. If you like it, please press the thumbs up button and we'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe if you haven't already. If you have anything you'd like to say to us, please write it in the discussion section below. We'd love to hear from you and have a great day.